we have an announcement to make. You've probably heard it on other channels, but now you're gonna hear it on ours. Myself, Ben, and some of the team, Josh, my partner Chris, and others, we're coming to Chicago. What are we doing in Chicago? We're doing a few things. Ben, why don't you tell the audience? What are we doing there? Well, we're gonna visit with our our team there. We have a team of uh, people who work in Chicago. It's also one of my favorite cities in the entire Mine country. Too. I, love I haven't been Chicago. there in a long, too long. So we're going there. Uh, you know what, Ben, explain. What are we doing there? Well, we're going to meet, see each other. That That's always nice. But we're also going to be seeing clients and prospects, too. So if you're in the Chicago area, want to see us, meet with us, learn about our practice at Riddles Wealth Management, reach out. Where do we, where do we send people? We're also seeing uh, advisors. So if you're a gruntled member, we don't like disgruntled advisors, but if you're an advisor that is perhaps looking for a change, wants to learn about how we work with clients, please reach out to info at RittholtzWealth.com. We're really excited to see you. Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by Kelly ETFs. Michael, a while ago, we had Kevin Kelly, who helps run the Kelly CRISPR and Gene Editing Technology ETF. Pretty interesting stuff. So what this ETF does, it's ticker XDNY. Wait, XDNA? That makes that makes more sense. Yeah, XDNY. XDNA, get it? Uh, they're looking for the next industrial revolution, which is healthcare predicated on CRISPR and gene editing technology. I wonder if this has the potential to become the third horseman. When I think of like biotech ETFs, I know this is not necessarily biotech. Or is it biotech? Is CRISPR biotech? I guess so. I think of X XBI and IBB. I wonder if this could be the third horseman. So they share with no us sense. that. There's four horsemen. My bad. The, the third the stool. There you go. The third leg of the stool. The CIA, they said that CIA just invested in CRISPR company that is looking to bring back the woolly mammoth. This is like, remember, we saw a gold-plated woolly mammoth in Miami at some bar we went to? What? We're looking to bring this back, like Jurassic Park style. I mean, I'm a huge dinosaur fan, but do we need woolly mammoths? I mean, if I could channel my inner Jeff Goldblum, they had their chance. <laughs> All right, here's another one. Uh, another CRISPR first. New treatment wipes out teens' cancer. So they're using this, this technology... This, this gene editing to, to basically wipe out cancer in teenage girls. Pretty interesting. Well, I have an ask. I have an ask if we're doing this. Can they, can they fix my back? That's a teaser for later. Okay. All right. If you're interested in learning more, go to kellyetfs.com. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Michael, today, I feel like we've been bordering on this for the last eh, couple of readings, but it feels like the crisis Wait, what's stage. what's today? Of what's today? Oh, sorry. Today is Tuesday, February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day to Happy you. Happy Valentine's Day to, to you, too. I love you. Uh, we're about at about 10.30 a.m., give or take. Uh, Actually, speaking of love, let's just, before we get into the inflation, so Ben and I stayed in Miami at a, in a hotel room together. Ben stayed on the pull-out couch. And <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> Miami is a party town, great nightlife. Ben and I went to dinner, great dinner, I might add. And what do we do after dinner? We looked at the bar. We looked at the clubs. And, and we, said, we nah. let's go back to the hotel room at 9.45 <laughs> p.m. Sleeping <laughs> by 10.30. A couple old dads. All right. Yeah. Bye. I like Miami. Uh, One so last thing just, in Miami. One last thing in Miami. God, I love our audience. I got, a, I got at least half a dozen How's Your Mudroom. Matter of fact, yes. that was about the only inside joke comment that I got was, how's your mudroom? Thank you for asking everybody. Lots of people at the conference were wondering how your, how your mudroom is coming along. That was, that was pretty good. Uh, I think we were teetering on the edge. It's kind of like pushing the pop machine over. That was the old Jerry Seinfeld reference. Like it takes a few pushes to get the thing to fall over. I feel like the crisis stage of inflation is behind us. It's no longer the most important number. It's still a important number. It's not the most important number. So the market didn't Wait, really I must move. ask. I must ask. I must ask. If, if inflation, and I don't entirely disagree with you, but if inflation is not the most important number going forward, then what is? I think it's going to shift. I think it could be Any GDP growth, labor market. Housing, I think those all, I think they could all be vying for, it's like the bachelorette where like each of them is going to get a rose and we're going to whittle it down over time to see which one is the most important now. I'm gonna, if we had a pie chart of what's the most important thing to the market right now, I think I'm going to still say inflation is, has the biggest slice of the pie, but it's down at least dwindling half. Right? At so least that, I mean, the, half. the market just hasn't been moving as much. So the market was kind of unchanged on the inflation reading today. It went down a little, now it's up a little. It's just, it, we're not getting these huge, we had so many days there where inflation was moving the market two, three, or 4%. And, and it was happening in the days leading up, the days after. So this is the seventh month in a row of lower inflation, but it barely fell. It fell like, you had to go two decimal places out to see it fall, I think. So 6.45 to 6.41. It's falling, but not as fast as the Fed would like. So what are we calling this? Like annoying for longer, confusing for longer? Higher sure for longer. 
it sure seems like the higher for longer. So well, what the, happens? The, the stock market, the stock market hasn't, sorry, I'm doing a lot of interrupting. I apologize. The stock market hasn't moved that much today, but you know, it is. The reason why I say higher for longer is because the two year is now at four, six. It was at four, one, two weeks ago. So maybe the bond market is saying, actually, this is the steady state for the rest of the year. The Fed is not well, going it, to cut. If you wanted to look at the takeaway here, and I think the case for inflation remaining at like, Four percent or so, somewhere around there, for a little bit of time is is starting to settle in and making more making more sense because, and the reason is because, unemployment rate remains low and the the economy is still remains strong. So I think that's one of the reasons that inflation is going to remain strong is because the econ- No one, I don't think anyone thought the economy is going to remain strong, which is going to keep inflation higher. I think that's. What well, I wonder. I, think- I wonder if today's today's reading was a, win, a bit of a win in the sense that well, here's the loss. I mean, and you could find uh, people that know more about CPI to talk about this than us. But services has not slowed down, so that is still increasing. Well, look at, that is look at this, a huge look component. At this, look at the, this chart from Michael McDonough from Bloomberg. He put this U.S. CPI contribution to the year-over-year change, and look at that blue line from services slowly going up as energy is coming down. Food has remained pretty steady recently. Goods x energy has has fallen a lot, so it is services that's kind of leading the charge here. So it does seem like the main takeaway for me here, to your point on short-term bonds. Short-term rates are probably going to remain elevated for a while. Look at this. Six-month T-bills hit 5% today. So I have the new 60-40 portfolio for everyone. 60% T-bills, six-month or three-month T-bills, 40% whatever the new bubble Tesla. is. Because well, because it seems like we get a new bubble every three months. So just invest in whatever the new bubble is, and that's your new 60-40. So after the jobs report a few Fridays ago, um, I think people were maybe saying, oh, shit, is inflation about to – we accelerated coming hotter than expected given how strong the labor market still is. And it was slightly higher than expected this print, but all in all, all in all, I think it's okay. I don't, don't think it's great. Think this is, this is speaking, looking for wins here. Wouldn't you rather have 4% inflation in a 3.5% unemployment rate rather than a 5% unemployment rate and 2% inflation? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's winning. I think, this, I think I think this is in like the economy reaccelerating and, and avoiding a recession for the time being. I think that, that but that's the funny thing is the fact that the Fed raised rates so fast. They're probably just going to have to hold that if they do another twenty five basis points, because if inf- inflation is eventually going to come down to their rate, it sounds like. Right. Uh, well, gonna, also the economy is 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 too in too good a shape to to cut it. It would make no sense here. Hey, what what you're wearing a bright red shirt underneath your was that J Crew, long sleeve. No, not this is a my new uh, place is Marine Layer. Instagram okay. got me on this place. Oh, I think I have one of those. It's kind of expensive, no? It's a little. You got you got. I, I look for the for the deals, but it's very good fabrics. I love. But like you're it. wearing you're wearing a bright red shirt underneath. Actually, I have a Marine Layer hoodie. It was expensive, but very nice hoodie. So that bright red shirt underneath is that a, is that Valentine's Day? Is there a heart underneath? What do we got there? My five year old Kate was upset that I didn't have any red on today, and so I to in solidarity for Valentine's Day, I needed to put a red shirt on. Is it a plain tea? Just a plain red tea, yes. Okay, all right. Is that okay with uh, you? That's okay. Just, I just want to get a better picture of what if, we're, if we're doing. With. If we're doing fashion talk here, a lot of people on Instagram when you posted the picture wanted to know Which why picture? you were wearing. It was me and you sitting on beach uh, chairs, sipping yeah. on Miami vices, and you were the dad wearing socks on a on a lounge chair at the pool. Robin asked me why I was wearing socks. Well, the reason why I was wearing socks and they're is black because, socks. Yeah. Well, I'm a black sock guy, but everybody was in suits. More or less, except for us. We, we rock the tropical bros. Yeah, we, we I stuck I out a little bit. How, how did you not have socks on? Because I didn't wear sandals. Did you just take your socks off? Yeah, I mean, we're in 80 degree weather. I'm wearing shoes, no socks. That's the look. Ugh. Ugh. Shoes, no socks. Have to do it. Or, you, yeah, you have the ankle ones. You can take them off. Okay. No, I'm a sweater. I can't do that. My, 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 my sneakers would turn to mush. Back to inflation. There's, here's from Tom Lake. Uh, best pr- he had he did a thread. The best best proof is thirty four percent of CPI basket by weight is an outright deflation. So that doesn't mean in, a number is co- increasing at a smaller pace. That means that they're actually going down. The fifty year average is thirty percent. So again, thirty four percent of the CPI basket by weight, not component by weight, is coming down. It's a good number. It seems like we're in a position where inflation is falling, but maybe not as fast as some people would like. And it's also not remaining as elevated as other people would like. So it's in it's kind of kind of a weird middle position where it's you can't call it Goldilocks because it still remains too high, but it's it's not like it's going to extremes. It's not immediately falling, but it's also not remaining above seven percent like some people were predicting. 
I think air, airline prices are finally coming down. I hope so. The, the April flights are out of control. I'm not going anywhere in April. Oh, 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 oh. Message alert. Message alert. I, uh, ben, I think, I think we're going to take next week off. And I'm going to be in Disney. So I don't even want to pretend to jam a show in. Is that okay with you? I mean, we've never missed one before, but I did it from Disney. I'm just saying, <laughs> Duncan did it from Disney. Uh, if you're going to be the one to end the streak, that's on you. No, that's not true. We did miss one show, and I think you were in Disney when we missed it. Ah, uh, that was like the we, we had just started the pod three months in or something. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm, just, I'm just if you want to miss it, that's fine. But I'm just saying I, no, I listen, did it from Disney. I, I'm a big I'm not, the show. I'm a big the show must go on guy. I understand how frustrating it is to go for your podcast regular and it's not there. But listen, we've been doing this since November 2017. This is my I'm first one. You know the 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 best part about actually having the excuse to do the show is I got to leave Disney early and let my wife and in-laws handle the kids for the rest of the day while I came into the podcast. So it was actually well, a nice break. But, see, there you go. I've got no in-laws. We're, we're flying solo, and I don't want to do it to my wife. I love her too much. No, uh, di- yeah, Disney is, is, is a jam-packed thing. So, uh, All right, car prices, used car prices increased 2.5% in January. This is from at Car Dealership Guy or at Guy Dealership, who has become a favorite of the show and a, I guess a darling on Twitter. Guy posts great stuff. What are we? What's going on? This is the largest month-for-month month percentage increase since the end of 2021. Why is this happening? I don't, I don't get it. This is one that you'd think would just fall back in a straight line because of the. Maybe the the takeaway is you're just not going to get a straight back down. I I've looked at this before in the past when when inflation fell in the 40s and when it fell in the 80s, it didn't just go down in a straight line. It could right. have some hiccups along the way. And that's probably what we're seeing. So, where- so, so this is why I still think inflation is going to be the dominant story for the year. Assuming it doesn't just go straight down, which I don't think it's going to, there will there will probably be some spooks along the way, if I had to guess. You know what else is a bad news for inflation? If we actually get an alien invasion, I think that's inflationary because there's going to have to be a huge infrastructure spend once they decimate all of our cities. All right. So you want to bring me up to speed? I've pretty much avoided this. What's happening? No, I've kind of. Okay. I, I mean, I, I can't. I can't get into it. Okay. I, uh, the funny thing Earth. is, is if aliens really did come, it would be like a big story for a while, and I feel like people would probably just get over it if they didn't. Assuming they didn't like turn us into like, nah, that's uh, bad. Thing. No, it would be, be, be the biggest story of the of the, of the century. Uh, Walmart bigger than LeBron going to Miami. <laughs> All right, Walmart. This is from Carl Quintanilla via Reuters. Walmart is warning major packaged goods makers that it can no longer stomach their price hikes. Pitching its own private label products to shoppers as less expensive alternatives to suppliers named brand goods. Hey, wait a minute. Is Walmart going to break inflation? Unbelievable. So, I did not so see that So does that, that mean they, they take the no-name stuff from the floor or the ceiling and put it in the middle and put the name brand stuff down there? Yeah, I guess so. Hey, let me ask you this. You know we're so dependent on the markets for narratives. What happens if the S&P 500 is down 2% today? <laughs> it just rolled up. Well, what if it was up 2%? Because it seemed like economically the number was bad at first, and people were like, why isn't the market falling more? I don't know. Um. Kathy Jones said the NFIB survey, I feel like we should know what that is. National Federation of Individual Businesses. What do you think? Survey says? National Federation of Independent Businesses. Ah, all right, close Close. enough. The number of firms raising prices in January fell to 42%. That's the lowest since May 2021. Plans to raise prices in the next three months is 29%. Inflation is still a concern, but less so than the past six months. I, I'm having a hard time believing any economic surveys these days. I feel like for the past 15 months or so, it's it's just a watch what they do, not what they say kind of economy. I, have, I don't think we can I believe hate, what anyone says. I hate to say this, but I think in the case of inflationary surveys, it matters because it's inflation is very much a psychological mindset. Don't you think, don't and, you think a also, lot of these businesses, though, are just waiting to see what their competitors do? It's kind of like a, I'll, I'll lower prices if you do. And, and and someone has to be the first one to just kind of go and do it. I guess it depends on the business. All right, I kind of laughed at this one from Sam Rowe. This is from Wells Fargo. The bear market is over. We see neither a bull nor a bear market, just a market. And it is kind of funny, and it seems like that's a, that's a punt, but it, it also could be kind of true, where we're not going to see the market just take off again and go crazy, or we're not going to see it crash, and things just kind of... I those markets this. exist, too. This is a good call, no call. Yes, I, I it's I think it's whatever. It's within the realm of possibilities. Plus I, I just feel like the the narrative overdrive from the economy is just changing on a week to week basis. The, the the economy is just playing head games with us. 
in terms of the, the, the switching that it's done on us. Every, every month, two, three months, we're getting a new narrative about what, is, what exactly is happening. So Google just filled the what, – what, there's a gap that got filled. It's not from earnings. What was this from? Hmm. From Microsoft, January, right? No, 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 no. There was a big gap on the chart from January 19th to January 20th, a big gap up that got filled. I'm not sure why the gap up happened, but as they do, this gap got filled. Bank of America said, I don't recall a flurry like this of big tech companies racing to one-up each other in a topic ever. In late November, chat GBT gained mainstream buzz. In December, Sundar declares a code red. February 6th, Microsoft announces it's hosting an event. We've gone, we've gone to Plaid in this AI search real fast. I would not want to be the one to try to pick the winners here, but if, if I was just using like a baseline set of expectations, if I was trying to get into this whole AI thing, I would have a hard time betting against Google just for the sheer fact that there's inertia involved there. And people are used to going to Google. And I feel like even if Google's AI was 10% worse than Microsoft or whoever is the competitor, I think most people would just stick with Google. It's like it's like the, your dentist. You don't want to change who your dentist is because you got to change all your records and and move all your appointments and go to a different place. It's just easier to stick with who you, you're you with, right? Yeah, not knowing literally anything about this, this moving Google seems like a big overreaction. That's what I'm thinking. Okay, this is a good listener question. Hey, guys, so I work in tech at a company whose name ends in a .ai. How many are there? Did, are we doing a lot of those, like Long Island Ice Tea .ai, that stuff? Is that happening? We should change it to Animal Spirits .ai. Got to oh, yeah. ex- expand the audience. And there is all this talk of an AI bubble and how VCs have quickly moved from crypto to AI, not to mention all the buzz around chat GPT. Question is, can you have a bubble in a high-rate, rising-rate environment, or do we need low rates easing Fed as a precursor to any bubble? I think... A lot of people assumed because the 2010s and because the pandemic was low rates that that was the only way you can get a bubble. That is, that is not true at all. There's been plenty of, look at, I put this on here, 10-year treasury averaged 6% from 1995 to 1999. Mm -hmm. It was falling a little bit there, but it was rising in 96 and 97 as well and rising all through 99. And it didn't really, the, the bubble didn't really prick until March of 2000. You can certainly have. I looked at the 1925 to 1929 bull market. Ten-year average 3.5% and really didn't deviate at all from that number. One of my favorites, in short-term interest rates, right now I said they're 5% on six-month treasuries, treasury bills. That's what short-term interest rates were when Charles Ponzi ran his scheme. But he mm. was promising 40% a month. So, yes, you can certainly get a bubble with rates being elevated and not at zero. It's easier I've, to get a bubble probably when rates are lower, but that, that's not ne- necessary as a precursor to a bubble. I've got two observations on this AI stuff. Number one, I was searching my phone. Chris and I, I think we're on the train, searching my phone for pictures that we've taken in Chicago to see if we had been to this one place. As we mentioned, we're coming to Chicago. And what it is able to do is insane. So when you search on your iPhone, and this is a new feature as far as I can tell. So when you search Chicago, it does two things. Number one, it pulls up photos that were taken in Chicago. Number two, it pulls up the word Chicago in any of your photos. That's pretty freaking rad. Wait, what is this for? On your iPhone. Oh, on the phone. Okay. So when you search for Chicago, again, it doesn't just pick up photos that were taken in Chicago. If you have a photo, if you have a picture that says the word Chicago. So for example, there was a picture I took. I don't know why. I took a picture of, my, uh, of a TV in 2015 and it had the valuations of NBA teams and the Chicago Bulls was on there. And there was a bunch yeah, of that's pretty different. Cool. All right. Here's an, here's, here, so here's an idea. So that's a feature from Apple. Here's an idea for a new AI feature. Somebody who's who we're going to be meeting in Chicago proposed a bunch of meetings using CST. What if in the new version of Gmail, whenever it says it gives, whenever somebody gives a time zone, it automatically switches to your time zone. Boom. Okay, or you can just do it in your head and add an hour. Nah, I'm not. For some reason, the time zone <laughs> things always trip me up. I'm like, okay, wait also, a minute. You you said where you mentioned we were going to Chicago. We never actually said it on the show here. Well, I just assumed that you would understand that we were going to record it before. Oh, is that what we're going to do? 
Okay. Yeah, we record it after. Okay. Uh, uh, all right. Is, so, uh, so is it what? is it possible though that for AI to be as big as some people think it can be and not become a bubble? That's probably impossible. Correct? Impossible. Like, yes. No, I think it has to be a bubble. There will be a bubble. Uh, is it a bubble right now? No, it's tiny. It's way too early. No. I think it's way too early. Yes. Um, you, yeah. Th- this does not feel like it, no. This is not a bubble. So Goldman has all these baskets. They have like a non-profitable tech basket. They've got a soft landing basket. I don't know what's in here, but if you look at the chart, it's on fire. Do you think a soft landing basket is just like home builders and it would have to be economically it would have to be economically sensitive stocks. Yeah, cyclical. Right. So home built, yeah, cyclicals, basically. Okay. Instead of calling it a cyclical index, they just called it a soft landing index. It's good marketing. So the 10 year is at 376, highest level. In over a month, the two year is so two year, so rates are moving. Yeah, two years, two years ripping four six highest level since November. So that's the story after the CPI print. We'll see where we'll see where things and, shake out. And All still, right. and still not even close to inflation. Bond yields are still well below inflation. Like it seems like bond yields are moving way higher, but they also moved a lot lower, and they're still well below the inflation rate. Um. Well, finally, people are people are coming back. Bond ETFs from Eric Balchunas. Sorry for your loss, Eric. Not sorry. Hell of a Super Bowl. Hell of a Super what Bowl. Loss? Oh, because he's a Philly guy. Yeah. Uh, Bond ETFs. Credit to me for putting a bunch of money on the Chiefs because I never bet against Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes won me a lot of money. I bet a lot on the Eagles because I thought they were a better team. But their defense did not show up. Their defensive line, zero pressure, zero, zero pressure. The only thing that saved me was I bet on the Eagles to win the first half and the Chiefs to win the game. So that uh, it's pretty good that saved me. All right, anyhow, bond ETFs having best start to a year in flows, taking in $20 billion in January. High rates, low rates don't matter. They're taking cash and are now this close to doubling their AUM since the black eye, some worry days of March 2020. And he's taking a victory lap, a victory lap, as he should. A call we made and got right. That's him and Tom Serafagas. So anyway, again, bond ETFs having their best start to a year in flows. This what, is not they surprising. Were, they were this, saying this, that money is going to pour in because rates are higher? No, no, no. I, I think I think what Eric is alluding to is people were saying that ETFs, bond ETFs broke in March 2020 and people wouldn't use them. Ah, and I think you took the okay. other side of that. Okay. Uh, ben, you ben, you like this. Uh, you like to like anecdotally say like, oh, it's a junk rally with no evidence. Well, I'm here for you. Bespoke tweeted. They You're putting words the, in my mouth on this though. I'm not. I'm not. All That's I say just, is that those are, every, these are the facts. Every time, are, no, every time a bear market bottoms, the junkiest stocks go first, and everyone calls it a junk stock rally until it turns into an actual rally. That's what. That's just what happens. No, but I think like you say that you say that po- with a poo poo face. I <laughs> don't know face. because I think the people <laughs> the people who don't believe in the rally are poo pooing it. I'm saying what, right, every that, bear market, every bear market that ends begins with a junk stock rally for the next bull market. As it may, and now rates are really accelerating, and stocks are really going lower. Be that as it may, Ben. Bespoke described this year's equity market performance as, a, quote, a dash for trash. In a client note, uh, they report that the top 10% of the most heavily shorted stocks were up an average of 36% this year, while those in the lowest tenth of returns had risen by, well, that doesn't that part doesn't matter. But anyway, what, what, time, do you, what do you make of that? Just in time for everyone who went to like high quality stocks in December because it was a bad year in 2022 and those stocks did good. That makes sense. Uh, so, so we were, so at dinner, uh, on whatever night that was in Miami, Jim Bianca was talking to us about, what are they called? Zero day uh, options. Zero day options. I'd never heard of this before. He was basically saying how it's screwing up volatility in the markets. It's screwing up the VIX that you have these options that they come out one day and they expire that same day. Which you know, is I, just I noticed, I, I felt that I felt my gamma sense is tingling. I, I'm honestly surprised we've never, I mean, we're not big options guys, but I'm, I've, I'd never even heard of it before. I guess they, the, the financial times had a story on them and Barron's had a story on it. And it sounds like it's, it's really screwing with the market's volatility and har- making it harder to understand what's going on there. Oh, because all right. We're out of order here. We're out of order here. My bad. But Ben, look at this next chart from, uh, from, I don't know who this is. It's a prime book, global equities. The short covering was the highest since 2016. So again, these are just facts. You say what you want, but moving on to back to what Jim said, He's talking about what might be driving the vol. He has a chart showing the 20 most trading options today. Highlighted in the name column is the expiration date. All 20 expire today. These are called zero DTE. Unbelievable. Who is trading these? It's got to be institutional investors. 
And I'm sure retail to a lesser extent. It can't all be Is it retail. like it's some sort no of way. short-term like hedging to rebalance? Or I'd like to hear a good explanation. There's got to be some sort of hedging mechanism in place that these would make sense for. Because I, I don't really get it. Yeah, I wonder if it's yeah more less specu- less outright speculation and more hedging. Who knows? So more, Jason's, yeah, Zweig, more that. Jason's Zweig had a piece in the Wall Street Journal about why investors are piling into funds that promise to not beat the stock market. This is interesting. Covered call options. So covered call funds. We've And we've gotten, admittedly, a bazillion questions on this. And most likely the, the J.P. Morgan Equity Premium Income Fund, it's J-E-P-I. And well, first, it was, it was the NASDAQ one. It was QILD. Yes, but lately it's so because J-E-P-I had a good year last year. So Zweig explains uh, covered call funds – uh, provide limited protection against losses if stops drop in exchange. Drop in exchange, they preclude you from capturing all the stock market's gains. Basically, it's a case where you're selling options, so you're getting some income, and that means that you're going to cap your upside, but also limit some of your downside. And the J.P. Morgan fund also trades in lower volatility stocks. So last year it lost three and a half percent. The S&P fell eighteen percent. I think they said the Nasdaq one lost 19% compared to the 32% loss. Oh, wait, the I wonder how, how, how much of that loss was due to stock selection as much as taking call premium. It was probably mostly stock selection, if I had to guess. More of it, you know what yeah. I mean? The, the, the yeah. call premium is not going to be, yeah, so. But but, but, but I'm saying, the, like, people people that are buying this are probably doing it because they look at the 2022 performance and say, oh, my God, yes. this is like a panacea. So I like to call this fighting the last war. And this happens every time that there's a huge moving the markets after the huge bull market in 2020 in 2021 everyone wanted to pile into arc right mm-hmm. after the 2008 crash everyone wanted a black swan fund or a big short fund when it should have been the opposite now let now it says zweig says jp morgan fund took in almost 13 billion dollars last year the the biggest annual haul for any actively managed etf ever wow three covered call funds from global x ETFs attracted a combined 5.2 billion in 2022. So far in 2023, 3 billion more is coming into these funds alone. I'm not going to offer an opinion on these types of strategies. I think this is the type of strategy that can work. My problem with people is investing in something they wish they would have invested in because it would have looked good in the past. And if you hey, hey, constantly hey, jumping hey, from, hey, hey, hey. Sounds what? like you're it sounds like you're stepping all over my strategy. <laughs> but well, trust me, I've, I've been there before too. But if you're constantly looking for, oh, I would have, I wish I would have invested in this because the bull market, and I wish, wish I would have invested in this because the bear market. It's if you're going to pick a strategy like this that you know is going to underperform in a rip roaring bull market and outperform during a bear market, you have to stick with it the whole time. You can't just jump in and jump out. Mm-hmm. It's not going to work. All right. Speaking of jumping in and jumping out, yes, this is from Etoro. Good data here. They look at the average U.S. equity holding period in years going back to 1975. In the 1970s, it was five years, dropping precipitously to the 80s, jumped a little bit, and then now it's 10 months. But can I just say one thing? This is a, it's a good chart. There's a lot to take away. This is I'm not this is not a chart crime. I will say, however, though, that like the average holding period has been under a year for a long time. You know what I mean? Like it was under a year in 1987. It was under a year for the entire 2000s decade. So this is not a this is not a new phenomenon. No, I think if you took this back to the 50s and 60s, it would be even longer. It would probably be like more like 10 years or eight years. But it also says the average U.S. mutual fund holding period is two and a half years, measured by its turnover ratio, uh, which is you know that that that's probably more representative of most normal investors because I think a lot of people have stock trading strategies that that do turn over a little more. But well, let me put it back to you this way. Are stocks meant to be married? I don't think so. I don't think that you should buy and hold individual stocks forever. I think a ba- like a basket of stocks, sure. But I have no problem with uh, turning over individual securities. I think that lowering the barriers to entry and making trading free has actually probably been worse for investors. I think most investors would be better off if they buy and ha- they bought and held. Unless, unless people learn early on that trading is very difficult and then switch to a longer term horizon. We just talked about the fact that if you jump from strategy to strategy, just I've, you and I have both looked at the data. If you extend your, your holding period in the stock market, your result, your probability for a gain goes up. The more you trade in the short term, the more you trade in the short term, obviously you're right that individual stocks can and will underperform the market. And most of them do. The data has also shown that, but I think most people would be better off if they bought some stocks and held them. So uh, I don't know how big a component jobs are to the City Economic Surprise Index. I'm sure they're a pretty decent size. But Lizanne Saunders tweeted, Friday's job stunner. So this is, we should have used this last, year, last week. It's a bit stale. But Friday's job stunner, 
which uh, the job report is what she's referring to, helped propel City Economic Surprise Index for U.S. higher by a significant degree. The daily change was the largest since June 2020. That's good. Okay, right. moving along. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it is. Uh, so Benedict Evans does this no, it annual... Is. <laughs> Benedict Evans does this. Uh, well, I feel like the data comes out all the time, and and stuff from last week is already stale. Yeah. It's uh, again the changing narrative thing. It everything feels good for a couple days and bad for a couple days. I think that's just where we are. Benedict Evans is a venture capitalist who does this annual presentation where he puts together like a two hundred charts. And I, I pulled a couple of good ones. You, you looked at this too, right? Holy shirts and pants. Okay, so I this went to them. I went to the mall the other day. My we had a daddy daughter dance on Friday. And I wanted oh, to look, lovely. wanted to have my fit look nice. So my daughters got all dressed up. They had the corsages, right? It was, I think it tops off. Is like it corsage or flower? Yeah, the little thing you put in your wrist for like a dance. Did you ever go to like homecoming or prom? I dabbled. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I went to the mall and I just couldn't believe how dead things were. Like stores oh, yeah. closed when they should have been. So he sh shows the department store as a share of U.S. addressable retail revenue. It went from, you know, it basically averaged between 20 and 30% between 1930 and 1990. And it's just fallen off a cliff since then, down to less than 5% now. And I, There's no I bottom here, by the way. There's no bottom here. No, I don't. <laughs> well, bottom might be close to zero because it's just so much easier to buy stuff online now. All the department or all the places that you can buy online offer free returns and free shipping. And most, if you go to an actual store that, like, the, Good luck finding the size that you need. Well, let me ask you this. Is free shipping a bad thing? So I'll, I'll get to this later, but I feel like I'm always going to UPS to return stuff because my wife just orders four different sizes and three different colors and just returns whatever she doesn't There's like. I, I, I do a lot of that too, returning, but it's free though. For right? us it is. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, this, this is, a, is this was a, this was an excellent excellent report. We'll link to this in the show notes. Well, the, one more. It says how much retail retail space do you need, and it, it's retail square feet per capita, and it shows the U.S. versus the U.K., Germany, Spain, France, Italy, and Japan, and it shows standalone retailer shopping malls, and like our per capita retail space is three to four times higher than all these other countries, and I don't know what we're going to do with all this real estate when these department stores and malls. When most of the, I mean, like the high-end malls and stuff will probably be fine. But there's there's going to be we, Bed Bath & Beyond we talked about going under. What are they going to do with all that space now? You can't put apartments there, can you? I don't know. They should be converted into a laser tag. WeWorks maybe? Okay. This is a good one. Someone I think you, you, you put this on here, but someone shared this uh, a per, of a person who was laid off from Meta in November. After three months, seven offers on the table, accepted an all-cash offer from a startup for $315,000, which is 70000 above what Meta used to pay them. This is why I obviously always feel bad for anyone getting laid off, and that's a terrible position to be in. But if, if we're seeing all the headlines of people in the tech industry getting laid off, rel on a relative basis, that's probably better than the alternative of people in other sorts of jobs getting laid off because these tech people – are probably because they're so highly educated and have good experience and there's so many other tech companies out there, they're probably going to have an easier time finding new jobs than, than most other people would. Brad Gerstner wrote an open letter to uh, Facebook a couple of uh, months ago asking them to reduce their headcount. And one of the points that he made eloquently was, listen, I'm not trying to be insensitive to anybody's livelihood, but think about how strong the labor market is these people will be able to replace their incomes. And I'm sure it's not true for everyone. And this is obviously just one example, but I think there's probably something to that. That tech you know, the people next... are much better are much better positioned yes. to get another job than, say, blue-collar workers would. The if, next there was, time like, if there was you... an economic recession. I have a strategy for you. The next time that you want to complain about uh, your steak being overcooked... The next or your time. Drink... It was one time! <laughs> or your drink being wrong, you should write an open letter to the waiter or waitress. Because an open letter sounds way better than complaining to the manager. Listen... Just write an open letter on your phone and like send them a note from, my, from your iPhone. It was a one-time thing. This is an, an interesting... open letter from Michael Badnick. Okay. <laughs> Some, uh, Daniel Zhao tweeted... Uh, well, this is quite the juxtaposition. It's a headline. Boeing to hire 10,000 workers in 2023 as it ramps up production. That's one headline. The other headline is Boeing says it will cut about 2,000 white-collar jobs in finance and HR. So I wonder if there's just a bloat of middle management in a lot of these giant companies. 
this remains the rich session where people who are higher up are getting having a harder time in the labor market than people who are lower down the totem pole, right? Yes. Uh, so there were more layoffs announced. Uh, they're not slowing down, really. Yahoo uh, announced uh, 20% staff or 1,600 people. 20% is an aggressive cut. Twilio did 70% of the workforce. LinkedIn, uh, which is interesting because that's in the job market. LinkedIn, LinkedIn laid off staff in its recruiting department. They should have the easiest time of anyone finding a new job. You would think. Sam has a chart from Goldman showing roughly 15% of companies in the S&P 500 have seen headcount increases of 40% or more since the start of the pandemic. And only one fifth of them have announced layoffs so far. So I think, I think what we perhaps missed, like if we saw all the headline hiring sprees, the way that we're seeing all the layoffs, I think that would help with context. But again, you need context here. These, these companies added so much. Well, this so is from 15%, the Wall Street. 15% increased by 40% and only one fifth, only 20% announced layoffs. Had any layoffs. Well, this is from the Wall Street Journal. Listen to this. Employers in healthcare, education, leisure, and hospitality, and other services such as dry cleaning and automotive repair account for 36% of all private sector payrolls. Together, those services, those service industries added 1.2 million jobs over the past six months, accounting for 63% of all private sector job gains during that time, up from 47% for the preceding year and a half. By comparison, the tech-heavy information sector, which shed jobs for two straight months, makes up 2% of all private jobs. So all the bars and restaurants added 99,000 jobs in January alone. Healthcare industry grew by 58,000. Retailers added 30,000 jobs. It's, have you ever seen this movie, The Company Men, before? Never heard of it. Okay, it's a 2010 movie. It's got a great cast. Costner, Cooper, Tommy Lee Jones, Ben Affleck. It's, it's got a really great cast, and it's, it's a total, remember in the aftermath of the 2008 crash, you had all these movies and TV shows coming out about people who are down in their luck. And this is this is a story about um, Affleck loses his job and has a really hard time. He was a, you know, middle management, higher management at like a GE kind of place and lost his job and couldn't find a job. The, the movie has some cheesy, corny parts to it, but it, it really does a good job of nailing the sentiment that p- people at the dinner table were talking about, hey, did you know the CEO of the company makes 700 times as much as the average mm-hmm. employee? Mm-hmm. And like, these are the, these are the conversations people were having back then. It's funny because at the time, it felt like that environment was never going to end. And right. it feels like right now, this current environment is never going to end, right? It's like every cycle that you're in, it feels like it's going to last forever. And you know that at some point, things are going to be different. But it's hard to figure out. It's, it's, it would be hard to tell someone back then, in the 2020s, you're going to have the most robust labor market you've ever seen in your life. And back then, people would have said, I don't believe you. And they, the whole thing was about him. It was impossible to find a job. He had to go lay sheetrock with Kevin Costner's construction crew well, and it's just, I mean, it back then, to in 2010, that. I couldn't find a job, and we already know that I had a sterling resume. It's true. <laughs> uh, but Ben, you just mentioned uh, Affleck and Cooper and Tommy Lee Jones. How come? And I think it just it just sounds weird coming off the tongue. But anybody who has a two two part last name, you never refer to them by their last name. It's always first name, middle name, That's middle true. last name, and last name, right? Yeah. Does anyone call Tommy Lee Jones just Jones? No, but right? it's Lee Jones, but you would never call him Lee Jones. If somebody said to you, oh, man, Lee Jones was great in The Fugitive, you'd be like, huh? <laughs> but wait, is, is Lee a part of his last name or his middle name? It's a last name, like Brian Austin Green. It's Austin. It's not a middle name. It's the last name. No, no, no. Austin Green, is that's the middle name. Mark Paul Gosler, Paul is the middle name. Tiffany Amber Thiessen, no, Amber no, no. is the middle name. Mark Paul is his first name. Gosler is his last name. <laughs> Brian uh, Austin Green. I think Austin Green is his last name. I could be wrong okay. on that. Or most of these people make them up because in Hollywood, people change their names all the time, and their real names are not what they actually screen names. Could be. Let's talk about crypto for one second. So Tom Dunleavy shared a chart, weekly crypto asset flows, which uh, which they weren't deeply negative. It's just completely flatlined, right? Had Go just completely time, yes. flatlined, and they three consecutive weeks of inflow. There's a, a data.bitcoinity.org. We're looking at Bitcoin trading volume. At Coinbase only, uh, it's picking up, but not like dramatically. People are not chasing price just yet. Doesn't it feel like, in terms of sentiment, that AI has already completely surpassed oh, yeah. Bitcoin pe- pe- or crypto? Yeah, pe- people are completely over crypto. But there's a bit big announcement this week. I want to read this from Hester Pierce. She works. What is her exact title? Because I don't want to. Hester Pierce is an American lawyer who serves as a commissioner on the Securities and Exchange Commission. Okay. 
She said today the SEC shut down Kraken's staking program and counted it as a win for investors. I disagree and therefore dissent. Kraken operated a service through which its customers could offer their tokens up for staking. The customers earned returns and the company earned a fee. The commission argues that the staking program should have been registered with the SEC as a securities offering. Whether one agrees with that analysis or not, a more fundamental question is whether the is whether SEC registration would have been possible. In the current climate, crypto-related offerings are not making it through the SEC's registration pipeline. Using enforcement actions to tell people what the law is in an emerging industry is not an efficient or fair way of regulating. And then this guy, Jason Gottlieb, who is ostensibly a lawyer who works in crypto, did a thread and said, I find the SEC's all, quote, all crypto projects have to do is come in and register, end quote, line, unbelievably insulting. It assumes there's this vast quantity of sophisticated security lawyers and advising clients, quote, nah, man, screw the SEC, YOLO, baby, do whatever you want, end quote. Tons of projects and their lawyers desperately want to come in and register, but when they do, they're just told no, or worse, they draw a Wells notice. There is simply no path to registration for many crypto products. The SEC says just register. We say cool, but it's what? Because the regs just don't fit. In response, we get blank stares, apologies, and mumbles that they're not going to give us legal advice. So I obviously can't speak to what's going on exactly, but it seems it seems like the SEC is hell-bent on not making the lives of these companies Remember when easy people at all. thought it was going to be a positive that Gary Gensler took over the SEC because he taught like oh, a yeah. crypto class at MAT or whatever. Yeah, that didn't quite come to fruition. Huh? No. So uh, anyway, that's that's what's going on there. Um, all right, moving on to physical real estate. All right, what's Steve happening in the Eisman, Steve Eisman, who maybe is one of the people who didn't completely have their brains broken by being a member of the Big Short team. He's, he was talking about housing with uh, Joe and Tracy on Odd Lots, and he he did the calculation that shows the affordability from going with a 3% mortgage. He said, as long as people are employed, they're not going to sell their home down 40%, which is what you'd have to do to get the affordability level from a 3% mortgage versus 7%. They'll just live in their home. So housing prices have come down some, but they're still, but it's still the case that I think the housing market is locked. You, have not, you and I have been talking about this for a while. Mike Simonson, one of my favorite weekly updates, pretty much the only thread on Twitter that I like. He does a thread and, every and, and week. Lance, and Lance Lambert. Yeah, okay. But Mike Simonson does the same thread every week. Oh, that's true, on, that's true. And so he's showing that inventory, he's at home buyers are defying expectations or sellers are not eager to sell. Available inventory of single family homes dropped by 3% this week. You can see it, it shot up and it, that made sense that it would shoot up because mortgage rates went up. Now it's crashing again, inventory mm -hmm. levels. Just no one wants to sell. They had a story in the New York Times about people who own homes and they're just renting them out because they have 2.8% mortgages. Uh, this, this one woman actually in Los Angeles owns a home and rents it out, but is renting her own place to live and basically wants to buy, but doesn't want to get out of the rental because the rental income is so good for a, such a low mortgage rate that she's willing to live in a rental and not buy her own home to live in so she can rent out the other one. It's, uh, I think maybe we almost underestimated the 3% mortgage. As much as we talked about it, I think that you're going to have ripple effects from that for a long, long time. Where like inventory is going to be suppressed for a while, I feel like. In terms of the, even if you have demand for people wanting to buy, the number of people willing to sell is going to remain low. Right. If you, I don't know what percent of the, we, I think we had this chart, what percentage of homeowners are locked into a, a mortgage under three and a half percent. Those people are stuck. So I think if, if you're, if you can afford it, and we talked last week about how there's not very many affordable new homes to buy anymore. And I, I wrote a blog post on this, got a lot of, a lot of people who had some strong opinions on it. Uh, I, I said the reason for that not having a lot of, you know, starter home available is because of prices are higher, inflation, people wanting bigger houses, and then builders not being incentivized to build smaller homes. And so people want to trade up. This is from one of our local builders. They're giving a new build bonus up to 15 grand that covers closing costs, or you could take your ticket off of your final price, or you could buy it on your rate, or you could extend your rate lock, all these different things for 15 grand. I think new I think builders are going to be the ones to come in and incentivize people, and that's going to be the where you can find your deals. If if you're if you're having trouble in the existing home market, I think builders are going to incentivize people to get off the sidelines, and they're going to be the ones. I just did a quick check in on my neighbor. This house has been in the market for 211 days. I don't think this is right. This is probably just a glitch, but it says that he did a price cut uh, January 31st for $290. I'm going to go ahead and assume that that's not real, but. Helps with, helps with the closing costs. But but I think that this is probably fairly 
emblematic or demonstrative of, what, of what's happening. Sellers just are not meeting buyers where buyers want to be. Right. And they're not, yeah, that's... So Lance Lambert did say among 150 major housing markets, uh, 24 have seen local home prices fall by more than 5%. And it's, it's honestly the ones that you would assume. San Francisco, Austin, San Jose, Phoenix, Seattle, Las Vegas, Boise. It's the places that had the huge upswings in price. It makes sense. I think the case Schiller is still only, it's, it's a, on a couple months lag because it takes a while to update that data. It's still only down 3% from the highs or something. Here's another one from Lance Lambert. San Francisco has already given up 42% of its pandemic housing boom. But Chicago has given up just 4% of its pandemic housing boom. So there's this great chart showing these are the cities in which the home gains are, are barely falling. Turning my head, that's Cleveland, Chicago, Minneapolis, Detroit, ah, Midwest, Atlanta, New York, D.C. I mean, the, the, the houses are still basically near all-time highs. This is kind of the same thing that happened during the housing bubble the first time, though. There was a lot and of actually, other places that went bananas, and the ones in the Midwest didn't quite do that. So the ones that are falling the most, maybe not surprising given the, the rich session, rich session, it doesn't roll off the tongue, is San yeah. Francisco and Seattle. Makes sense. Okay, survey of the week. Ref this is from Gallup. Reflecting on their personal financial situations, 35% of Americans say they are better off now than they were a year ago, while 50% are worse off. Since Gallup first asked this question in 1976, it's rare that half or more of Americans say they're worse off. Only other times this has occurred was in 2008 and 2009 for the Great Recession. What do you make of this? I don't know. This is pretty noisy. It, I think it, it could be. It's, no I away. guess it's, well, the takeaway is, again, people hate inflation. How's that? Well, that's true. Um, inflation right, makes ben. people uncomfortable. I want to tell you, I want to tell you in the audience about my, my Saturday. So on Saturday, I had, I had one of the most dad Saturdays I've ever had. And I say this not to complain at all. There's no complaining here. This is just, just a glimpse and every dad listening and every mom listening can nod their head at the commitment that it is to raise a child. Uh, all right. Again, not complaining, just, just mentioning. Like if you told me 20 years ago, this would, be, this would be my Saturday. This is like the Bed Bath Beyond. I don't know if there'll be enough timeline from old school. <laughs> this is an open letter to your past self to understand what's, what you're, what's, what's happening. Pretty much, pretty much. Okay. Also, so I, I rewatched Old School last week. Still holds up. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, timeless. All right. So I woke up and I went to the dump. This is after getting the kids situated and breakfast, whatever. I'm a huge dump guy. I love taking. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Sorry. Sorry. I don't know. I love going to the dump and taking my 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 equipment and my garbage bags and my cardboard boxes and. I don't know why. I just, I enjoy, I enjoy it. I just enjoy it. There, I said because it. Because when you have a family, you produce so much trash. Yeah. Like, why don't Boxy. you just wait for the garbage man? Because it's overflowing. That's why. So you get rid of this, you get rid of that. All right. So I went to the dump. Then I came home to get like six boxes and packages to go to the UPS for the drop-off, which by the way, I got there at nine o'clock, which is when it opens. And I was second in line. There was like six people behind me. And I had like six things and I started to get nervous. I was sweating, anxiety because I felt people like looking at me like, come on, move it along. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, great. Anyway. Behind this guy. Yeah. Yeah. This guy. Oh, uh, Starbucks. Then I did a Target pickup. Then I went to a card store to get Pokemon cards for a birthday party. Then I picked up an acai bowl for my wife and Logan. I took Kobe to basketball. Then after that, we went to Chocolate Works to get, uh, to get Valentine's Day chocolates for, for teachers and grandma. Okay. Then I went, I took Kobe to a birthday party. This was, th these are great birthday parties. You know, movie birthday parties. I did one of those when I was probably six teenage mutant Two, teenage mutant Ninja turtles Two, secret of the use. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. I did that for one of my birthday parties. So the kids saw puss in boots. You know what I did? I saw Take a movie a of my, I saw a movie, movie of my own brought AirPods and I watched a horror movie. What do you mean you brought AirPods? I, I sat in the back row and I watched. Oh, Air on your phone. Oh, on your phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So although the Puss in Boots movie, the music was like dra was a little bit getting to my ears, but whatever. I watched uh, I watched a movie which I'll talk about later. All right. So here's the thing, Ben. At 1:40, just as they were about to serve cake, Kobe and I had to leave. We couldn't stay for the cake because we had a party at two o'clock that we had to get to. We get to the party. And there's like a bunch of video games. And so Kobe's asking to play the video games. I'm like, just, just wait for the, just wait for the party. So you're going to play, you're going to play, you're going to play. 
I hear one of the one of the people who works there say, uh, party starts at 2 30. So I'm like, no, it doesn't. It starts at 2. And she says, no, 2 30. So I look at my watch, it's 2 10. I'm like, wait, what the heck is going on? This person called for the party at two that didn't start until 2 30, as if it was a wedding. Who does that? Is that chutzpah? What do you, what do you mean? The the invitation for the party said two o'clock. Okay. It the party did not actually start until two thirty. Okay, that's bizarre. That is that is nerve. That is huge nerve. Especially so with next, kids. So next year for this person, we're going to we're going a half hour late. I'm just going to assume that she just called. Not unbelievable chutzpah. I was not too thrilled with that. All right. So then Robin met me at the party, swapped Kobe with Logan, took Logan home, went to the park, got home at four o'clock. It's a lot, right? I mean, right? Yeah. And it was a lovely, for- love, lovely Saturday. Yeah. However, there's, there's no lounging. There's no lounging on the couch anymore when you have kids. Um. Oh, here's here's another quick story that I forgot to tell you. So when I got when I got out of the airport on Sunday night or whatever we got home, I'm walking to the taxi stand and I take out my phone to look at the Uber and it was seventy five dollars, right? So a guy comes up to me and says, uh, I'll, I'll take you home for 80 bucks. He goes, I said, where's your car? He goes, my car's right here. So I said, sure, done. His car was not right there. It was across the street, across the street, in the parking lot. It wasn't that far, but whatever. So we get to his car. He's pulled over. Um, his blinkers are on. And there's somebody in the front seat who's lying all the way down. So I'm like, this is a little bit strange. He goes, oh, it's just my wife. So <laughs> I'm like, all right. So I get in the car. And I, I start to get a little bit nervous because this was not an Uber. This was just a dude. And he's telling me that he's taking his wife to the casino on Long Island. I'm like, casino on Long Island? Where's that? So anyway, it was a bit, it was, it was a bit dicey. Like I, I, this, this was not, this was not an Uber. It was All just a, a guy. The locks go down. Yeah. Right. What was that movie? Oh, um, with Angelina Jolie. The Bone Collector. The Bone Collector. That's exactly what I thought. I thought I wasn't yeah. gonna be able to get out. All right. And then lastly, Ben. So my back has been acting up again. I haven't been to the chiropractor since 2021. And now that I've been taking care of my body a little bit, exercising, building muscle, lean muscle, I might add, just kidding. Uh, my back has been pretty good. However, over the past few days, I've started to feel just a little, a little ache, you know, just a little wear and tear. So I figured since I'm going to Disney, I should probably just get adjusted, right? Just go to the chiropractor, just get adjusted. So I'm lying down have you ever been to a chiropractor before? No. All right. So I'm lying down and there's like a, there's like a, a, a hinge, right? And I'm lying down and they drop my, my feet, right? So your legs are like down and you're flat and you're, you're flat in your stomach. And he's pushing around, pressing around, showing me where it hurts. And he goes to like crack my back, like in the middle of my upper back. And that's my lower back that hurts. And as soon as he did that, I go, ow! <laughs> I'm like, ow, 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 ow. <laughs> it hurts so bad. And I'm like, oh my God, this motherfucker just destroyed, <laughs> destroyed my back. I'm going to have to be in a wheelchair for Disney. So you, at that point, do you say I'm not paying? You hurt me? It was, it was a $15 copay. And okay. Yeah, I should have said, let me speak to your manager. So I want to send this back. Yeah, it hurt, the letter. It hurt <laughs> so bad. <laughs> So for the rest of the day, I've got my heat pack. I've got my icy hot. And I went back this morning. Now, when I went back, I said, listen, am I really dumb for coming back? The guy goes, no, why? I said, well, you know, not to be a jerk, but I came here yesterday with moderate discomfort and I left with a limp. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> he goes, all right, we're going we're gonna to be conservative. I've seen this a hundred times. Like, obviously, you, you know, it's more serious than we had thought. So anyway. Thank God I went back this morning and like, I, I think I'm on the mend. I think I'll be okay for Disney. But it was yeah. unbelievable how much pain I was in with this guy. The moral of the story is you're an old man. So basically, yeah, yeah. So anyway, anyway, I'm an old man. Okay. So that's a great little segue into uh, this article that you shared with me about Fleischman is in trouble. So we talked about this before. I, the thing I liked about it the most So wait, was hold that- on. In conclusion, and I hate to be preachy. I'm not being preachy. It's just like a, hey, if you're 26 years old and you're listening to this, just like- Take a second and be like, yeah, this is awesome to like have zero responsibilities. And, I'm, and again, I'm not complaining. I love it. Very happy. But 
That's Michael's all. a ghost. Michael's the ghost dad from the future coming to tell you what's coming. Exactly. So they, the dad we, from the future past. We talked about Fleischman and Trouble before, and I liked it so much because it, it dealt with money. And they they did a real life. We're going to talk to these people who live in Manhattan and feel like this. And this they quoted this one. People were dunking on this left and right on social media. But I thought it, she said it's so crazy how rich you have to be to live in New York comfortably, just comfortably. There's a very subtle heartbreak that perhaps people have made better life choices than you, and their houses are bigger and they're happier. And she says the crazy thing is that this friend at 45 has not only an apartment in the city, but a, a weekend house outside of it, one that she bought with earnings from her successful career and enjoys with her partners and kids. You and I were having a drink at the Soho House in Miami, and you you made the comment to me, we were talking about this article, and you said, you're lucky you live in the Midwest because it is way, way worse, this kind of stuff, this keeping up with the Joneses, because there's such a concentration of wealth on like the around a big city like New York. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for me, the, the one of the takeaways here, and listen, I, of course, social media is going to dunk on this, but I think this is real life shit. Like there's a few, there's a million takeaways. One is then money can very quickly turn from an asset to a liability. Yes. And I'm not saying like, be careful what you wish for. Like, oh, do, you know, being rich, having money is so hard. I'm, I'm not saying that. I, but I am saying is that. It can I mess th- with your head in big ways. Yeah. It, like the, the level of, of where money becomes to own you, it might not be as high as you think. Yes, you're right. It, the asset to liability thing is, is, is big. So, yeah, I so mean, nobody wants to hear about these people's problems, but they're people too. And uh, I think especially when you have a concentration of, like you felt that in Miami, like there was a, felt, just felt like there was a ton of money in Miami. And I can see how living that environment would, would kind of drive you crazy. Yeah. If you're, you're if you're surrounded by, you know, Porsches and it's only, it's only human to, to want and to feel like you don't have enough. And anyway, Great article, or interesting article, I should say. Great show. I really enjoyed that show. All right, one in three U.S. consumers say they have cut down on food delivery. 47% of those cited the high cost of delivery. Yeah, no shit. A meal <laughs> delivered can be as much as 100% more than dining in, given higher menu. So, yeah, again, I, I spoke about DoorDash last week. Obscene, truly, almost borderline offensive how much how much this, this thing costs. It is, it is probably just as cheap to just eat at the restaurant. I mean, you have drinks and stuff there too, and a, and a maybe a bigger tip. But all right, uh, one more parking lots. No, no, no. People- let's, do, let's do the babysitter oh. thing real quick. Okay. So la- last year, last year's national average babysitting rate was twenty two sixty eight an hour for one child, a staggering twenty one percent increase in just two years. That's about what I pay. It's a lot. Ours is probably twenty. Do you think you need to pay more for multiple kids, or is it the same? Because we have three kids. Oh, you gotta you gotta pay more for that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think it also depends on the behavior of the kids. True. I'm Age. sure you have great kids, but you've got three of them. It's a lot. Also, yes. you, have to, you have to vary it. So, for example, when I have my babysitter come over in the morning if I'm traveling, Robin leaves, Robin leaves at like 6.15. So we need somebody to come at 6.15 in the morning. That's until a big the ask. Kids, so that's a huge – so for that, we pay 30 because that, that that's, that's, a, that's a monstrous ask. Okay. A bunch of people sent me this article from Vice saying – um, American cars are getting too big for parking spaces. Someone mm. has been saying this for a while. They talk about how... Take a bow, Ben. Take a bow. They talk about how, like, there's regulations on the size you need to make for parking lots, and the cars are just too big for them now, and they, they only leave, like, a, a finite amount of space on the sides, and it's it's so much more expensive. They said for a surface lot, it costs $7,7500 to just build one parking space. And Wait, in a say, garage, that again? Could, say that again? So what does that mean to, for a surface lot? So, like, if you're building a parking lot, it costs seventy five hundred dollars per space. But oh, if you're building like an underground garage in the city, it can be like two hundred thousand dollars per space. So, the people who are building the parking lots don't want to make the spaces bigger because they want to fit more parking spots because it costs, right? That they're looking to recoup their costs. I noticed and, at a birthday party this weekend that there was a Yukon that was the spots were not built. This is an old parking exactly. lot. Exactly. Spots were literally not built for cars that big. In 1985, three out of every four vehicles in the U.S. were sedans or wagons. Today, that has flipped. Three out of every four are SUVs or trucks and larger vehicles. I still ask, and I know we, I know we showed the Volvo station wagon a couple of weeks ago, but how did our parents deal with us? Where did we, everything they go? Sh- they shoved us all in the same seat three in a row, and yeah. Yeah, but what about all the stuff? Maybe we just didn't have stuff. We didn't. I didn't have anything. I didn't. I didn't I had nothing when I was a kid. My parents didn't bring. Like you know how That's your so kid true. always had, I had no I had no possessions. I had one pair of You know sneakers. how your kid always has a water bottle with them? Yeah. I never got water. I never got water when I was a kid. It was a drinking fountain. I never had a water bottle. Yeah, kids right? are every soft kid these days, days have a water day, bottle. We used to just pass out from dehydration. Yes. That was a joke. Okay. And a bad one. Um, all right, so showtime is effectively dead. 
Did you listen to the podcast with uh, Matt Bellany and Lucas Shaw? No, they're going to fold it into Disco- or Paramount Plus, right? So, so I think what they're doing is they're just going to lean into sequels. Like, they're not going to do any more original content. Remember when they lost – well, they're still doing Your Honor, but they lost, like, Ray Donovan and another show I can't remember. Uh, what, what was the show? Shameless. And a few – like, they just – all of their hit shows just went boom, 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 done. So Showtime, as we know, the, the, the channel will still be there, but it is not going to be the Showtime that we remember. Um, so Warner Brothers – was going to combine Disney Plus, I'm sorry, Discovery Plus with eight with HBO Max into like a super app. And it sounds like they're now not doing that. They're probably just gonna have to bundle all these together. And they're not they're not gonna I feel like the, they're not gonna wanna put them all together, so they're just gonna have to do a bundle. You get this one and this one and this one and that one. You get four or five or something. Who's gonna who's gonna do the bundle though? Good question. Verizon? I don't know. Apple. But they'd have to, the companies would have to say, yeah, uh, who knows? Um, all right, are we done? Uh, Let's do some recommendations. Okay. Um, oh, wait, before we get on, just last thing. So Josh and I were cleaning at our office. We're doing some redecorating, and I found my journal. And I know we've spoken about my journal probably in like one of the first couple episodes. It's been years since we – but I, I – so, so one of the things that I did early on in my trading career, LOL, was I wrote down everything that I did. And as you're about to find out, it was ludicrous. And this was integral for me in terms of discovering that I'm an idiot because I actually, these are my own thoughts. So for example, in, holy shit, holy shit, Ben, on this day, 11 years ago, see the date, 2-14-2012. That's right. <laughs> what are the odds? How about Nailed that? It. All right, so on this day, 11 years ago, I shorted Amazon. Shorted 100 shares at 18840. I'm sure the price is now five thousand dollars split adjusted. So this is my logic. News broke that their prime service added fewer than half of analyst estimates. Stock had been up 11 percent year to date. Can't read my own handwriting. What does that say? Does that say based on melt up? Based on melt up, we've seen this. Uh, anyway, uh, not a lot going on. Not a lot of intellectual. Uh, I just like how you wrote wrong wrong on the bottom here. I wrote wrong? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, because two days later, I shorted. Oh, credit to me. Look at this. Two days later, I shorted into weakness. I pressed my bet. And then it looks looks like I got stopped out of the way. But anyway, good good trip down memory lane. Way to go. All right. uh, Recommendations. I'll go quick. Uh, We're into shrinking on Apple with Harrison Ford and Jason Siegel. How many episodes have you seen? A couple. It's also by the guy who who did Scrubs, which I loved Scrubs back in the day. I uh-huh. I loved that show. Uh, I rewatched Prisoners. Wait, on hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang huh. on. You can't do that. What? I mean, you said I watched Shrinking. Now, I mean, there's you got to give zero context. I like it. It's it's, it's like I mean, a. It's you, like, come on, give us something. Do you like it? Do you not like it? I like it. It's like a ha- it's a half hour, forty five minute show. It's a Jason Segel is a psychiatrist whose wife died. I kind of like having a lighter, fair show that's not like super serious and. There's are serious tones to it, but I like having a comedy that you can just kind of like shut your mind and off. It, a and bit. it's a good, it's a good him and her show, right? Yes, it is. All right, I rewatched Prisoners on Netflix recently. Uh, I watched Denis. this. Like, Denis I did not news. realize this was your put boy respect, Denis. Put some respect on his name. I had watched this movie when it came out in like 2012 or whenever it came out, and I remember really liking it. And I had not seen it since then. I saw it on Netflix, so I watched it. And this movie was awesome. This movie rocks ass. And uh, what's his name? Hugh Jackman was amazing in this movie. Amazing. Yeah, that's like scene a hard where, just, that's, a, that scene where he's like hitting the sink. Yeah, he, like, and he's not like a hard old guy like that usually. He's usually like a softer, big smile on his face. He was great. That movie is awesome. Uh, Skeleton Twins with Kristen Never Wiig and Wiig. Uh, Kristen Wiig. Is it pronounced Wiig? I don't know. It's two eyes, W I I G, uh, and Bill Hader. And, is that true? I, I, I didn't know there's two eyes. All right. Go uh, on. So it's a it's a. Uh, 2014 movie maybe and I think the fact that these I think com- comedians should win more Oscars is my takeaway from this I'm not saying like this is like an Oscar worthy movie but the fact that they can go from like being hilarious and being like serious actors in the same movie it was kind of like a good precursor to understanding how Bill Hader is going to be awesome in his new sh- what was his, his HBO show oh bad Barry. that's a great point that's a good observation yeah that's all I got um, like they're, they're just they're very good at switching between like having a hilarious scene and having like an, a really dramatic scene in this movie are you up to date on Last of Us? Was there an episode this week? Yes. Or did they yep. not, there, 
There was episode six? They put it on HBO Max early because of the Super Bowl, so I could watch it on Friday night. Which was episode was that? The one where oh, the, the oh. zombies come out from out of ground. Oh, you know what's funny? I saw that, but I I, I was out of sorts because of our trip from Miami. I thought I was a week behind. Oh, I did, oh, that was great. Yeah, it was good. What a show. Um, all right, so when I was in the theater with kids, I watched a sadistic movie called Pearl, which is okay. the pre- which is the prequel. <laughs> it's an A24 horror movie. It's the prequel to X, which um, talk to all three of you who saw that movie. <laughs> Pearl <laughs> Pearl was very effective. Very effective. Okay. I feel like all of these horror movies are just one one word names and I've never heard of any of them. Uh, yeah, probably not for you, but for for those of you who ride with me on those movies, it was a good one. It was a good one. Uh, a gentleman approaching his 40s got kicked out of a child's birthday party for watching a movie that was too over the top this weekend. <laughs> All right. Uh, so no show next week. You're, you're, you're putting your foot down. Yeah, you down. know what? I'm going I'm to do one for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy time with the family. I'm going to take, hey, take one off. You know what? It could, it's been five it. years. It's been five years. Do it. Hey, I'm, it's, I'm just glad it's not me breaking the streak. It's you. Everyone, everyone send your hate mail to Michael. Do, write an open letter to Michael if you'd like. Well, guess what? I'm, I'm going to send it back. With, right. with peace and love, peace and love. Please do you not send for me a any week? letters. Uh, you know, I have. I don't even know what we're doing. I had. I had. I had zero to do with this planning. I don't you even know where out, we're going. Take out a home equity loan before you go. You're going to need it. Okay, that's great. Right. Animalspiritspod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you in two weeks. Ah!